the most asked question. Are neon tetras sensitive? Why do they die? I'm new to the hobby. What's going on? There's a lot to unpack here. I've always stood by, are neon tetras more sensitive than other fish? My answer to that is no. That being said, there are some factors which will weigh in that could lead to you having a harder time with them. We're gonna to touch on things like neon tetra disease or what's not neon tetra disease. We're gonna talk about what things go through to get to you and what factors may be contributing to all of this. First up, let's look at how they're bred. They're bred in massive numbers because they're one of the oldest fish People buy them in groups, and stores always have them, right? It doesn't matter if it's a chain store, mom and pop store, it doesn't matter. They're abundant. So typically what happens is they're sitting in a pet store tank. They got them from a wholesaler, and the wholesaler got them from a breeder or a farm, right? And at each of those stages, they're in massive numbers. Now, there's a few things that go on when you get to a store. You've got stores that have really high throughput. You've got stores that don't have so much throughput. And so what does that mean? That means like at a chain store, maybe you, they get 50 neon tetras and they sell 30 of them and 20 of them die from their system. That's still high throughput. Each week they're kind of resetting. Maybe uh, in a mom and pop store, you've got 50 neon tetras, they sell 30, and then they order 30 more the next week and they put those in with those neon tetras. So they have 50 again because when you have a full tank, they sell better. That would be a slower throughput. And that might take several weeks or whatnot. But you can imagine that if you had 50, you sell 30, you buy 30, you sell 30, you buy 30, you're mixing lots of different rounds of fish together. And as you keep mingling, you're more likely to pick up some diseases and things like that. What else is going on at the pet store that might be making them weaker? Well, in general, compared to other fish, we store a lot of neon tetras. So if you have 50 or 100 in a tank, you might go over to another tank and there's five rainbow fish, there's 12 angel fish, there's 16 Corydoras, right? But when a human is feeding tanks, yeah, we'll feed those neon tetras a little heavier, but maybe they get two cubes of food and the other tanks get one cube. But the reality is at 100 tetras, maybe they should have gotten five or six cubes. So over time as they sit there, they're losing a little bit of weight and maybe not getting the lion's share of the food. Now at a wholesaler, that usually is even exacerbated even more. So now, if we have 100 at a store, it's not uncommon to see 10,000 in like 180 gallons of water at a wholesaler. And yes, food's gonna go in, but making sure each one gets enough food is something you can't really guarantee. So it's, it's this weird thing, right? The breeder makes them, they gotta raise them, get them to a certain size, spend the least amount of money possible, least amount of food, least amount of cleaning, all that, sell them to, the wholesaler and the wholesaler goes oh well yeah i gotta do that same i don't want to spend a lot of money i don't want to do all this and so they keep passing along right so if the breeder goes well i'll do the minimum and then the wholesaler goes well i'll do the minimum and then the store basically is going well i'll do the minimum and then once a the customer gets it they'll feed them and they'll be fat and sassy and happy and they'll put on the body weight and everything will be great that works most times honestly but when it comes to the on tetras and these high stress environments that is where we start getting lots of disease and that could be ick it could be bacterial infections it just could be even neon tetra disease or false neon tetra disease and we're going to get to that in a bit here are they more sensitive i don't think the fish is actually any more sensitive do they potentially get kept in worse conditions through the chain i do think that could be true now not all stores are like that my store typically we want to get them in a week ahead of time we want to put meds through them we want to feed them a bunch and no one's perfect. We could probably feed better. We could do live foods. We could vary it up even more. But in general, our neon tetras do really well. And that is by design. So some of the things that we do to help kind of, uh, I guess, bridge that gap, and you could as well, is we buy jumbo neon tetras or large neon tetras. Because typically someone at a farm that knows they have to raise them to a very big size has been feeding them a lot. They're going to get more money for the fish and therefore they can put more money into the fish. And that translates all the way down to us and then eventually onto you. Where a lot of stores, like a Neon Tetra could just be 2 or $3, maybe even $1, where you're going, right? And no matter what size, they just sell it. Well, you can get Neon Tetras that are just tiny and very cheap because not a lot of work went into them. And, you know, not a lot of work's going to go into them, right? And they sell them for a buck. 
And then you've got ones that sell for three bucks. I think ours are up to three forty nine, but we're putting meds through them. We're putting lots of foods through them. We're buying the biggest ones we can get our hands on, and we're doing everything we can. But our end result customer has a much healthier fish, we hope, and we well, we see from evidence. Some of the things that I think lead people astray is foods. When you go and you read online, they'll say like, oh, they love frozen brine shrimp, blood worms, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, if you're buying a small neon tetra, that blood worm is the size of that neon tetra. I can't eat that. It's struggling to swallow it. It doesn't pass through its system very well. And so then maybe you're going, oh, well, we're just doing flake food. And yeah, if the flake food's nice and fresh, that's okay. But if it's a little bit stale, that's a problem. So things like live baby brine shrimp, frozen baby brine shrimp, frozen cyclops, crushed up flake food, maybe micro pellets, all of that stuff that they can take in will really help. Now, if you're new, what you need to know is things that fall past those neon tetras isn't really going to get eaten by them. They don't eat off the bottom. They only eat midwater. So getting them to have nice full bellies is kind of a challenge. You got to feed a little bit a few times a day. Now, if we have a neon tetra that went through a stressful trip to get to you and now it's in your home and you always seem to lose them, Part of it is trying to pack weight on from missed meals of, you know, the past maybe month or so. And so we can do one of two things. We can put a bunch of food in there and get ammonia spikes, and that's not good, and that no fish does well with that. Or two, we're feeding a little bit, and it's not enough to put weight back on and build up that immunity and the, uh, their immune system and all of that. And we get to neon tetra disease. This is one of the most misdiagnosed things I think there is in the hobby. One aspect i think it comes from people that are new to the hobby but then also people just don't know it's a big mystery so just because it's a neon tetra and it's sick does not mean it has neon tetra disease that typically is reserved for a mycobacterium which gets misidentified in the hobby all the time as fish tuberculosis which actually doesn't exist it's a mycobacterium we'll get into that and so if your fish you have neon tetras and they have ick it's not neon tetra disease it's ick or if it comes in and it's got a white patch on it, you'd be like, that's a symptom of the neon tetra disease or mycobacterium or fish TB. Yes, it is a symptom of that, but it's also a symptom of a fungal or bacterial infection, which is very, very likely. So I would treat for that first. In fact, we do at our store, but not everyone does. The misdiagnosing of it is one of the biggest problems because when you read about it, you go, well, there's no cure for uh, neon tetra disease and it's highly contagious yes those are true things but most of the time it's not that we recommend quarantining we recommend using meds we use meds all the time we would do general cure we would use ickx or general cure or paracleanse by the way ickx and mericin so an antibiotic antiparasite anti-internal parasite that cleans your fish up a lot and so they came in with a weak immune system we're going to knock out a bunch of the things that could take it down. We're going to build the immune system up with uh, food and, and, you know, care. Now, when it comes to neon tetra disease, if you've done all those meds and everything and you still have some kind of succumbing to it, yes, it might be neon tetra disease. But there's an article I'm going to link down below if you want to read some of the reports and the studies I read. And I'm going to read you a little, a little clip from this because, one, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's long. I don't want to steal their work, but I do think there is some applicable things. Like, well, when does mycobacterium thrive? What, what, what is the environment in which this fish TB or this neon tetra disease breaks out, right? So we, we've established how these fish live before they get to you and what happens. Now let's read what is an optimal scenario for this thing to break out. A paragraph in the article is titled, Environmental Conditions That Favor Atypical Mycobacterium. Mycobacterium organisms thrive under certain environmental conditions, including warm water. So we, we typically do warm water because we're a warm water aquarium. So check that. Uh, low dissolved oxygen. So think about the fish store, the wholesalers, and the farms. 10,000 neon tetras in 180 gallons of aquarium. Maybe they put meds in there. Oxygen levels typically do go pretty low, especially after you're, you're feeding, right? And so... It's, it's this weird thing of not having enough oxygen taxes your system very slowly. It doesn't kill you very quickly, but it lowers your immune system. And so I've been a big advocate that everyone needs an air stone in every aquarium because that's one of the surefire ways to keep oxygen very high level. Once I owned dissolved oxygen meters, that's what really proved that to me. So high oxygen rates, which 
in most stores and, and wholesalers and stuff, that's not going to be high. It might be okay, but we really want to make sure it's high. And especially if you bought them, you've got the CO2 uh, aquarium, high light, high CO2, manicured aquascape with not very much surface agitation. If you want to lose the CO2, you might have low oxygen levels, which is going to lead to, oh, we got warm water. We got low oxygen. Ooh, we're already up to two. What's the next thing that is favorable to this disease? Acidic pH. Well, wait a minute. Neon tetras come from acidic waters, and they're bred in acidic waters, and they like tannins and all that. Yes. So they're predisposed to want lower pH. So now we've got warm water, low oxygen, and low pH. We've already got the top three things that are going to make this outbreak, right? So then you've got things like lots of zinc. Well, we don't really have to worry about that one in our aquarium. That's good. High fulvic acid. Not so much. High humic acid. Well, if we got a lot of driftwood and catapa leaves and brown water and stuff, we could have that. So, But most of us don't. So I think we can check that one off as we're okay. Uh, and then an organically rich environment. Well, we could be setting up for that. If we had an aquarium set up for a long time, over time that gravel gets filled with organic material. Could be that we used an enriched substrate like uh, ADA soil, fluval stratum. Could be we did a dirty tank. All of those would be very high in organics, right? So we'd add another thing. So we've got four out of like six things that would lead to mycobacterium or neon tetra disease outbreaks. So an important part of preventing the diseases uh, is the exposure threshold of the host fish. So basically once someone gets it, it's going to start going everywhere. The recommendation is to euthanize that fish. As it releases some of the disease, it's picked up by other fish, right? And the longer they're in there, basically the more it's going to marinate and go to other stuff. How do you prevent neon tetra disease? Basically, keep clean water. Don't stress out the fish. The immune, the immune system, and it does go on, it says, I should, I should read that just so it's not, I'm not making it up here. Uh, although these organisms are common in aquaculture environments, so those higher stress environments, right? Uh, there's evidence that the disease in the fish may be associated with certain strains of mycobacterium rather than with all environmental isolates present. Poor husbandry, chronic illness, or chronic stress, sorry, and anything else that impairs the immune system will increase the likelihood that it will develop. So you got to think the farms, the wholesaler, store, all of those are stressful environments. They're not getting enough food, all of those things going, right? They finally get to your home, and they might not have the best setup yet. Does that make that fish more sensitive? No, I don't think it does. I think that is we as Aquarius don't have its needs kind of set out straight. So what would I do to prevent this? One, quarantine everything. That's a good thing. Run some meds through it. Two, don't keep them maybe at 85 degrees with discus. Instead, keep them more 74 to 76 degrees. That's lower on the threshold. The cooler you go, the less likely you're going to neon tetra disease, right? And they have a wide range. So even though that 78 is the recommended temperature, that doesn't mean they have to live there. That's just, just we have to pick a number. When someone says, what would you keep this fish at? 78 is kind of safe for everything, right? It's not going to kill it, but it's, we can keep it a little bit cooler. So I keep it a little bit cooler. Eat it really well. Live, live foods, frozen foods, fresh flake foods, fresh pellets, and just making sure we mix that up. Low stress, low, low stress. It's, it's, that can't be said enough. They just had a stressful journey. Get them into your aquarium. Give them tons of oxygen. Make sure they're not having to run from angelfish or apistos or any kind of cichlid and just kind of baby them. And that, a quarantine tank helps, by the way. If you bring in just your group of neon tetras and you feed them really well, and they've got good oxygen, and they've got the meds and all of that, they're off to a great start before they enter your display aquarium. So we can build them back up before we might put them into somewhere where we have ADA soil or any kind of built-up organics. That's one thing I didn't touch on earlier that I do want to touch on. One of the reasons I think they're perceived as uh, more sensitive is because typically people buy bigger groups. It's not uncommon for someone to have a brand new aquarium. Ah, give me a dozen of those neon tetras. That typically doesn't happen with more expensive fish or bigger fish, right? And so because they're small, they're colorful, and they're cheap, especially if you find that place that's selling that baby neon, never seen meds in its life, been fed twice ever, and it's a dollar a piece, people all the time are like, ah, give me 50 of those, give me 20 of those. High numbers, you know, one out of 50 has to get sick with the mycobacterium, and then it spreads, and then, oh, neon tetras are sensitive. 
Well, I think we've created an environment that lended itself well to that. I would say you spend a little bit more money. Typically, you get a little bit better fish. Buy them bigger and then spoil them at least for two months after you get them. Maybe after you add them for two months, you go, well, now you're now you're getting the same old fare as the rest of my fish, but they've transitioned well. And when you do spot the one that has uh, a problem, go ahead and maybe euthanize that or figure out what you're going to do. Now, one of the things, you, a lot of times you see uh, a malnourished or malformed fish, so maybe it's got a curved spine or something like that. That, I actually believe, is not so much the neon tetra disease. I believe that is breeding. So when you have facilities that make millions and millions of neon tetras a year, they're just counting. Well, they don't even count anymore. They take a net, and they know how much they weigh. You know, 500 neon tetras go into a bag, or maybe it's 1,000. They weigh x amount of grams then they go into the water then they go into then they ship right so no one's actually looking going hey that one's all bent it just weighs the same right you're just you're basically that's what happens at the highest level with feeder goldfish all that kind of stuff anything in mass mass numbers and so i actually believe that those are coming through uh the channels because same thing you hit the wholesaler now and they're going well i don't have time to sit through ten thousand tetras and pick out the 27 of them that had bent spines then they get to the store Usually the store will chime in at that point and go, ooh, let me get that one, let me get that one, because it makes them look bad of like, what's wrong with that fish? Now, where do they really get through? When you have those small ones, the small ones, you don't see the curvature of the spine and stuff like that, and so you're just, yep, 20, here you go, boom. Then they grow up a little bit, then they got the curved spine, one day you clue in on it, now they got neon tetra disease, oh my God, what am I going to do? So, neon tetras, one of the greatest fish ever. I love them. You know, getting a group of 20 to 50 of them in an aquarium is spectacular, especially against plants. They look really good. I myself have never had a problem with that fish breaking out with neon tetra disease. That doesn't mean I've never lost a neon tetra, but I've never seen it. Oh, they're going to take out all the tetras. They all died within six months, anything like that. Never, right? I have lost, like Hank, my first Mabu pufferfish ever to mycobacterium. It was really sad. And there's no known cure. So I am familiar with that. But uh, I've never seen it run rampant. And I don't know if that's just the sources we buy it from. We buy it from a few different ones, though. Or if it's just the way we take care of fish. But I genuinely believe they're not uh, more sensitive than rasboras or other types of tetras or, or danios. Like, it's just, you know, zebra danios raised in massive quantities, too. And they can they have their own problems. Uh, the one thing... I would say is there is a little bit with water parameters. And what I mean by that is if you're having, if you get your Tetris from a store and they're buying from um, a farm in Florida, right? They typically raise them at a higher pH than uh, someone maybe out of Russia or something like that. Like most of ours are coming in from overseas. Like we buy from a wholesaler and I don't know exactly where they buy, but I know in our softer water, when we buy from Florida, they don't do well. But vice versa, if you were to buy from us, which we don't sell Neon Tetras online, by the way, if you were to buy from us and take them to a hard water state, they wouldn't do great either. Now, where do we really see this become prevalent is in chain stores. The big box stores, because they have suppliers that supply, oh, you supply all of the West Coast, you supply all of the Midwest, and you supply all of the East Coast. Not every state and every city has similar water. But they're going to ship them those Tetras anyway, and that's where you can get that scenario at the beginning where I mentioned, oh, these ones, they buy 50, they sell 30, 20 die, 50 more come in next week. That's how that scenario kind of works out because they're landing in water they didn't even want to be in. They're not getting the care they probably needed. And because they're gone at the end of the week, hey, it's successful. Let's move on. Let's do it again next week, right? And so that's where you could be like, hey, these are a little sensitive. But if someone's doing their job, you should be getting some Neon Tetras that reasonably like your water. If you have radically different water than your store, talk with them about it, devise a plan. Maybe you special, you have them special order you some from Florida. You get them in the bag, you take them home, you quarantine them, and you have great neon tetra that's going to live for six, seven, eight years, depending on your care. It's, it's not super hard. It's just we typically treat fish as like, that's a thing, I'm going to buy it. It's a candy bar. Take it home, eat it, whatever, right? It's not planned where you might do a ton of research when you're buying a car or a house or something like that and you really plan 
fish in general for most people are that looks cool i need six of those or or they start with i need two of those i see those two of those look really good then the store talks you into six really they should be talking you into 10 they should be asking what your water parameters are what else you got going on what's the tank you're looking to go for oh high temperatures lots of organics uh oh low oxygen they should be talking you out of those things but instead they typically don't have the time or the staff and so they go oh yeah six Oh, you've got some, you know, you've got some angels and some other tetras. Yeah, you'd probably be okay. Here you go. Good luck. And that's why I think they might be sensitive is they're misunderstood and not respected. The The reality is when you look at an Eon Tetra, one of the most beautiful fish, it just happened to be the cheapest fish. If they were $10 each, I would still keep some Neon Tetras. Maybe not 100 because I'm not rich, but I might keep 20 of them and go, wow, these fish are amazing. And if they were more expensive, we would look at it going, oof. You know, that's $200. I better really do my research here. But instead, they're beginner fish. They're cheap. They're easy. They're cycling tanks and all of that. And so they get a bad rap. Neon tetra disease, very confusing. There is no known cure. You know, just like fish TB or uh, rainbow fish tuberculosis, all of that, it comes down to stuff that's not curable. And unfortunately, it can spread. That's, you know, but you do get a long time with these fish. And so they're falling apart quickly usually it's not neon tetra disease and and don't be afraid of a neon tetra do a little bit of research watching this video alone is going to put you at a leg up hopefully you're watching this video before you purchase and not watching it because your fish are already dying and this is all an assumption that your water was good you tested it and all of that basic stuff all the fundamentals to keep any fish alive were already done and this is purely for our neon tetra is more sensitive and i honestly will look you straight in the eyes and say i don't think they're more sensitive than the other tetra i just think they're misunderstood and they're valued less by your average person but if you're trying super hard to keep this tetra alive and you try super hard to keep this tetra alive i think you got the same odds so good luck and i hope you have a beautiful neon tetra tank for many years to come because it's something to be valued and cherished